I was born a long time ago in 1935, in the midst of a ruinous depression, and in a year when the Japanese were preparing to invade mainland China from their enclave in Manchukuo or Manchuria, and when Mussolini was preparing to invade Ethiopia from, which they called Abyssinia in those days, from uh, uh, Eritrea. And um, I found, as soon as I was conscious that I was born, although originally not knowing it, into a pretty unfashionable group at the time, uh, Irish Catholics. You have to be as old as me to remember how unfashionable we were. The places we could not get jobs, for example. Uh, the uh, uh, no Irish need apply. Uh, the last time that was uh, appeared was in a advertisement in Perth in 2012. Uh, but it was a common uh, uh, common tag in many advertisements. Uh, apart from the eternal prejudice against Aboriginals, we were a most dis mistrusted tribe attached to a mysterious and Baroque uh, religion uh, with sort of tribal habits which included SP book making and a lot of drinking. Uh, even in the year I was born, the British novelist J.B. Priestley, an otherwise urbane Englishman, declared that if there was to be an Irish Republic founded, uh, what an opportunity it would be for Britain to organise a fine exit of Irish ignorance, disease, filth and drunkenness. Opinions here in Australia coincided with Priestley's and jokes about dumb Irishmen are the residual stump of that old race and cultural hysteria. I had the honour to meet Kep Enderby in the old days in the excitement of those, uh, of those Whitlam years where not only did you have Jim Cairns giving interviews with his mistress in the Rose Garden, which showed uh, that maybe cabinet discipline wasn't as stern as it should be, but also uh, a period when many of the tied horses of deathly tradition were being let out of the stable at last, and Australia was being transformed. And of course, Kep Enderby and others, but Kep Enderby in particular, introduced ideas about vilification and discrimination with the uh, support of his, um, his Prime Minister, defining them as forms of injustice worthy of legislating against. And this is where our Commissioner comes from, therefore, from the vision of uh, Kep Enderby. Uh, and uh, we're very happy he had that vision, Commissioner. Um, it is an honour to speak in his honour tonight. In the years after the war, when I was in primary school and early high school in Homebush, that queen suburb, that pulsating, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 that pulsating uh, 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 focus of uh, glamour and nightlife, Nancyan exuberance. Uh, it was the, there was a, the crisis in Europe. The millions of undocumented displaced persons in camps, whom UNRWA asked the representative of democracies to cooperate in absorbing. One of the chief officials of UNRWA was an Australian, Gordon Jackson. In any case, worth looking into. Chifley's government took in the end some 200,000 uh, displaced persons, along with other migrants whose mix made Australians nervous. In 1947, there was a, a poll in The Age uh, which showed a, a high preference for Northern European migrants, an aversion to the ideas, idea of Jews, Italians, and, and Greeks. Uh, one contributor to the poll uh, spoke of the Italians and Greeks as the white abos of Southern Europe. We can laugh now, but it was no laughing matter 
when the Italians and Greeks did arrive in numbers. As for Central and Eastern Europeans, they were considered the ultimate in affronting strangeness. And despite the Holocaust, we're still anti-Semitic enough uh, to demand that Jewish immigrants, unlike perhaps former members of the SS, had to be sponsored by members of the Australian Jewish community. And of course, Sid Einfeld, whose highway exists out there in the eastern suburbs, was the great sponsor. Uh, I knew two Schindler survivors amongst the Jews who came. Leosha Korn came home from work in a Sydney factory after her arrival in Australia and said to her husband, Edek, it's wonderful. They hate the Catholic Poles as much as they hate us. <laughs> Equality at last. <laughs> Edek himself once remarked to me, when you arrive and the Australians don't know you or like you, they call you a wop bastard. And then they get to know you and like you and they call you a wop bastard. <laughs> The trial for my family, the central trial of this new wave of plausible people who could plausibly be described as the Australians of the future and who did become an honour to the Australia of the future. Uh, but the trial came when the Calabrians who had moved in next door offered my mother, who was a very tolerant woman, a basket of robust tomatoes. But we knew from observation that they used their own night soil in growing them. And why would they not, coming from a place as infertile as Calabria, a province of stones? My mother thanked them, uh, but the tomatoes of the Calabrians sat flashing their rich red at us for some days before we dared assay them. And we found their taste made up for the peculiarity of their growing conditions. Again, the more historical people of the day said of the newcomers, they'll never be Australians like we're Australians, a very common uh, sentiment of the time. We were wrong then, but as white Australia died, we sang the same song about Asians, and that now many of us, the, the children, of people who were despised in their turn singing that same odious can cantata about people from Muslim nations and Syrian and Iraqi Christians. Being worse, being wrong about one group only leads to trying to, uh, to trying the same rhetoric on another. For hysteria about minorities is a movable feast simply offering up a new people as its provender from generation to generation. Only the name of the target, the hated population, changes. I am always amazed how those who seek to make a life work out of race superior, a race hysteria, repeat the same rhetoric again and again without embarrassment. First, Pauline Hanson makes incorrect and garbage statements about Asians, and proved wrong in that regard moves on to a second political life with the same accusations about Muslims, as if the mantras of hate must apply to someone or other who's strange if she just keeps trying to apply them. <laughs> the only consistent object of the handsome Bible are Aboriginals. For at least 70,000 years ago, uh, stewards of a land we took only a couple of hundred years to back up. My friend, and if you want to see uh, this, um, uh, I'll tell you a profane joke I shouldn't tell you. <laughs> it's an earthly joke, I'm sorry. Uh, there is a, um, the Darling River, uh, which, uh, where I did some research last year, is a series of stagnant potholes uh, with uh, evil water and bits of tire standing in it. And a man in Wilcania told me that the inamorata of Barnaby Joyce said, Barnaby, do to me what you've done to the Darling River, only slower. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, the uh, uh, genuinely splendid historian Jeffrey Blaney, 
has reprised and explained the doubts he uttered about Asians in the mid-1980s. But it is a matter of record, he has not admitted that he was just plain wrong in his warnings. His statements were made in the wake of Vietnamese boat arrivals, and the politicians of that era deserve some considerable credit for backing away from the abyss of race frenzy that could have been released by the Vietnamese arrivals. In the aftermath of the fall of Vietnam Saigon, and before his dismissal, uh, Whitlam did take care to get a lot of Vietnamese out with the collaboration, secretly, with the collaboration of the Australian ambassador, G.J. Price. But his uh, view of the uh, Vietnamese boat, boat people was that accepting them might make relationships with um, the future Vietnam very difficult. After the dismissal and subsequent election, the Fraser government found in late 1976 when a mere third boat of Vietnamese refugees reached Darwin that the Melbourne Sun began warning of a tide of human flotsam and evoked the congenital Australian fear of thousands of, an inv uh, uh, thousands of invading Asians. By October 1977, Immigration Minister Michael McKellar said that there was growing disquiet about the boat arrivals. There is the possibility that massive numbers may be involved. But his remarks were careful, and he did not risk stirring mass phobia. With an election to be held in December 1977, he didn't quite know what to do. Senator Tony Mulville of Labour, uh, an Irish uh, Australian, declared that many refugees from Latin America were under greater political duress than people leaving Indochina. The normal stories were circulated that the boat people did not look like refugees. In the 21st century, such accusations are levelled at Iranian uh, asylum seekers on the untenable grounds that somehow only the poor could be genuine refugees and imperiled from the regime they have escaped. A health department official was reported as saying he'd seen people in worse health after the Sydney to Hobart um, race than after uh, the long journey from Vietnam that many of these people took in small boats. Uh, this sort of observation was rationally irrelevant, but the irrational always plays well in questions of immigration and race. And the Waterside Workers' Federation boss, uh, who had the colourful name, uh, Curly Nixon, said, who makes money out of a civil war like the Vietnamese Civil War? Civil war? Black marketeers, dope runners and brothel keepers. You've got the whole lot in these boats. The Sydney Morning Herald, however, warned against the policy of turning back boats and asked would not some of them be likely to sink on the return journey. Whitlam still doubted the legitimacy of refugee claims from the Vietnamese, but thank God the, he backed away, as McKellar did, from steering up, stirring up phobias. And I was reminded at that time of what a particular govern, governor of New South Wales, Lord Belmore, said to Henry Parks after there was an attempted assassination of Prince Alfred at Fontana by an Irishman. He was, he was an alcoholic and he was quite demented, but uh, Henry Parks wanted to depict all the Irish as potential slayers of royalty. Lord Belmore said to Henry Parks, once you let the dogs of sectarian frenzy out of their kennels, you'll never get them back. He said this in a letter in uh, 1868, and the warning could have been applied in 2000, I think, to those dogs that were let out so long ago are still barking at the fullness of their throat. 
and the, the avatars of that hysteria are still knuckly grinding down the lives of even people here on visas. In any case, um, McKellar, to his credit, published the holdings of the last 10 boat arrivals of 220,000 Vietnamese boat arrivals. He pricked the hysteria by showing that the, these people were carrying wealth of only $10,000 in total between them, between 220. The uh, Fraser government were uncomfortable uh, majority and the Department of Immigration at the time wrote in an official document, it is sobering to consider how easily today's well-established and confident citizen can, by the overnight imposition of unacceptable political and economic regime, become tomorrow's refugee. All available evidence <coughs> suggests that the Indo-Chinese refugees exhibit the range of skills, attitudes and backgrounds which might be found in a similar number of Australians in like distressed circumstances. Even so, according to the UN, nearly 400,000 Vietnamese died in an attempt to reach Australia, Canada and uh, the US. And this was a great tragedy. Uh, and uh, of course the question of boat deaths comes up in our era. Now John Howard is a likeable fellow, a man nearly as old as me. I don't agree with him on anything, but I'm always amazed. I mean, he wins, he won elections because he's an unpretentious, likeable fellow. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't like Elijah the prophet, Keating. He was, he was a companionable fellow who went to the cricket and went to the footy. A man nearly as old as me, a creature like me of Menzies, Australia, far more in love with the Menzies era than I am. I thought it was pretty boring. Actually. A far more, uh, except the only excitement was whether we were going to be blown up by atom bombs. A far more genial presence in public than is that aggrieved and reclusive prophet, Paul Keating. But John Howard was also the man who surrendered, as his predecessors did not, to the temptation of generating his story, hysteria as an immigration policy and a vote winner. Against the advice of his own defence chiefs, in October 2001, he took the fatal step of depicting the Australians, the asylum seekers, as people who threw their children into the sea. A coward Labour Party played along with a sort of hysteria light embarking on its perpetually failing campaign to out-coalition the coalition. The punitive proposition we are all familiar with, with now was put into play and any suggestion of compassion for the boat arrivals was headed off with, so you're in favour of people drowning, are you? No one's in favour of people drowning and documented mental torment is our only but is, <coughs> I'm sorry, but is cruelly and documented mental torment our only other option. Perhaps there are other options. And I ask the question in good faith. Now, the price of our desire to keep one asylum seeker offshore is claimed to be, according to the Calder website, $573,000 a year. What a pity we don't put them through Yale. We can do it. <laughs> the price onshore and within Australia is over $200,000 per year cheaper. And of course, we delay processing for these people. So we pay that year after year after year. We're very happy to cruel their progress towards becoming Australian citizens or knowing where they belong uh, by paying that year after year. 
We have paid undisclosed billions under commercial confidentiality to multinationals such as the graphically named Wacken, Hutt and Wilson and others to satisfy our frenzy and to oppress thousands of people. <coughs> Could it not be cheaper to put immigration officials in Indonesia with that government's cooperation to process people there more promptly and thus do away with the rationale of people smuggling. It is arguably economically viable to do so and it could be politically viable, but that proposition is never discussed. Instead, if you want a more urbane and decent system, then you must be in favour of people drowning. And certainly it would be cheaper to keep the individual asylum seeker in Australia, in the community, after a short trial period in detention. These questions are fobbed out off by the drowning proposition, which is so convenient to government. The government didn't show itself quite as worried about drowning during our ambiguous involvement in the sinking of the CVEX, the SIEV Act, our greatest maritime disaster. <clears throat> Although I would not accuse them frontally <coughs> of condoning that drowning, that mass drowning, uh, it is true that um, uh, they, uh, uh, there was a strange uh, lack of collaboration between government agencies in that matter. Thank you. Uh, nearly done, and, and uh, we'll, we'll have the divine Janice up here, quizzing. Um, it's fairly well known I was just a student of the priesthood when I was young. I, like the PM, once had theological certainties and a relationship to Christ. Thus I respect the theological certainties of the elected Prime Minister. I would be ready to campaign for his right to them. Recently my esteemed niece-in-law, Christina Keneally, a committed Catholic, asked the PM to look into his heart over the plans to deport a Tamil family and see what the Christian response would be. Labour's Joel Fitzgibbon made a similar suggestion. Both of them were criticised, not least by the Catholic Weekly. Uh, but I believe they are entitled to address the PM in those terms, given that the Prime Minister gave space to the matter of his Pentecostal beliefs during the campaign. So I choose to believe in his sincerity and thus would choose to address him not as a miscreant, as they did, but as a fellow pilgrim and brother in the Commonwealth of Australia. So if I had the honour of sharing a coffee with him, uh, I would simply ask him with proper respect for the fact that he is our elected leader, whether he is sure that our immigration policy, given the way he has been warned by leading psychiatric bodies about its cruelty and the way it grinds the soul, is the one that best honours our traditions. I would admit to a fascination with Christ, of whom scholarship, ironically, says that he resembled a present-day Iraqi, brown-skinned, brown-eyed, thick-set, Bedouin, swarthy, closer in Middle East and appearance, more akin <coughs> to some of the asylum seekers, and a long way, a long, long way from the quarterback Nordic Jesus of American fundamentalism. I would ask, not for the sake of wrong footing him, but for the sake of moral consistency that we seek in all citizens, whether he thinks this redemptive and phenomenal Christ is honoured by our immigration policy. For surely it's not just a matter of the PM and Christ and a cosy twosome. Surely it's a matter of the PM and Christ and us in the Commonwealth, his brothers and sisters. And then if it is not a matter, it is not just a matter of him, Jesus and us, it is a matter of him, Jesus, us, and them. 
They're challenging them, of whom every reputable psychiatric body says they are suffering hellishness, hellishly. And the question is, in Christ's name, need they? In any case, the reality is that on top of other problems created by a decision to punish asylum seekers arriving by boat, there are ne now nearly 9,000 people in Australia awaiting a decision on their status. Some 3,300 of them are in New South Wales. The delays in processing, which are part of this punitive regime, have created an unnecessary blowout in numbers. It's a matter of fact that all their souls like the souls of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, are in turmoil. Must the peace and order of the Commonwealth of Australia really require them to suffer like this? And I would ask Scomo that not to wrong-foot him, but as a citizen asks, and with respect, May I also say now and in closing that I have the honour to be an ambassador for the New South Wales Asylum Seeker Centre. At that centre, the generosity of my fellow Australians is evident in the food bank that never runs out of food, in the pro bono advice to asylum seekers from lawyers, in the treatment given to asylum seekers on the same basis by doctors, ophthalmologists and dentists, in the houses provided by generous Australians, to accommodate refugee families and in the jobs offered by its employment agency. The Asylum Seeker Centre is a triumph of volunteerism and of the generosity of so many of our fellow Australians. I am honoured and awed beyond words to be the Centre's ambassador and I invite your impulses of generosity to flow its way if they have not already done so. And so I hope the regime will alter and better solutions will be found, including the better solution of letting reputable medical opinion rule in the case of sick refugees. I hope that the shame of what the Commonwealth is doing ends for us all, for them and for us. And may all your tomatoes bloom rich and red. <laughs>